I worked as a maintenance guy, which means at times I gotta be there at odd hours to perform inspections with fire guys. I had a property that was about 60 miles away and needed a fire alarm to go off at 5am prior to tenant arrival. It's the day before, about 5pm. I take my car on the street in front of my house. The weather had recently shifted tempos, so all my tires were reading warning. It's a dual exhaust car, and it's running so I can use this piece of shit compressor. Think like cheap Walmart cigarette lighter air pump. It struggles to add 5 PSI. It's taking time, there's a light breeze, but it's only helping to push my car exhaust into my face. This whole time I'm near the pump and tire being inflated, so I spend a lot of time crouched or sat on the curb. I take this time to reiterate that this entire time, I said I was about 20 minutes, but I don't know for sure, time got wonky. My car is running, and I can smell the exhaust. It stinks, but I'm outside. The tires, after an eternity, are good. I'm ready for my journey in the morning. I'll be leaving at 4 a.m. I set my alarm for 3. I finished the night. It was unremarkable. I conversed with my wife. I got pity for having to wake up stupid early. The usual. So, I've already fucked up. As now in the story, nobody has a clue that I'm walking dead. The alarm goes off at 3 a.m. I fumble with it, stopping it, and in my attempt to get out of bed, I flat out fell, crushing a hamper. While I'm on the floor, my wife wakes to that noise, and all she hears is, ow, and then I get up and stumble to the bathroom. She laughed off my stupidity and went back to sleep. I took a shower, and I felt like I was drunk as shit. Must just be tired, I think. I'll shake it off when I start getting going. My memory of all of this gets spotty, so I'm using what I was told as well just for context. I got in the car, backed out the driveway, ran over a trash can. I think, shit, I must not be okay. I pulled back into the garage, closed the door, car off and all that. The trash can out in the street is on its side. I go inside to bed, lay down. And I'm out like a light. My wife assumed that I called in sick when I came back in. Surmised from the fall out of bed thing, I wasn't having a great morning. So a couple of hours go by. She wakes up and leaves for work. I'm still just out. I've worked at this place now for about five years. I have a strong working relationship with my co-workers. We all know each other's spouses and kids' names. I get a text that somehow wakes me from my sleep and I managed to respond via text to my property manager. She read it and was calling me immediately. I wish I still had the text, but it was basically gibberish with autocorrect lending a hand, and she knew something was off. So she called me. I picked up and we spoke for a second or two, and then she hung up on me. So I'm like, she's mad or something, whatever. Back to sleep I go. I just really wanted to sleep, but now it's probably around 9am. My wife comes back home and tries to wake me up. It's not effective. I got really spotty here, but she basically helped me to the car, and I remember her fucking slamming gears. We both drove manuals, and she was hammered down. I was calm. I just wanted to keep sleeping. So tired. So fucking tired. We got to the ER. No wait for this guy. Straight to a room, oxygen covering my face. IV in. They kept telling me I need to stay awake, but sleep was right there. I dozed off so many times. I was being scolded by the doctors. I remember being confused. Like, what did I do, bro? Stop talking down to me. I'm just trying to take a little nap. I'm not sure exactly how severe it was but based on the look on their faces, it didn't seem like a sure thing I'd be leaving out the same doors I came in. I remember being concerned and so tired. So very tired. This entire experience carves a gigantic black spot in my memory. I've had to piece it together from broken memory and accounts from my wife. I know had I not been taken to the hospital, I'd still be sleeping. 
I have my property manager to thank for calling my wife. She would have been gone for another five to six hours that day. I know I would have been in the bed still, with the broken hamper still under my side. If you made it here, use this account as a warning. Be aware. People said relatives will have the car on in the garage with open doors. To me, now, it's not worth it. If you smell exhaust, you need to shift position, unwind, move. This wasn't a rapid progression. I was coherent after the damage was done, while my body was still replacing oxygen with poison, suffocating myself from the inside. Be safe out here in this crazy place, strangers. I went on a vacation with my family. We stayed in a hotel slash resort right next to the beach. Every night, my family and me went for a drink or an evening stroll on the promenade. The promenade itself was also filled with a lot of people, especially couples enjoying a beautiful evening walk. On the third day, I couldn't sleep. My brother was still awake, but we had a fight earlier, so I didn't ask him to come on my walk. Now, before you think I was being stupid, it was midnight I think, and still the promenade was filled with people, so I put on some loose pants and a shirt, nothing fancy, and I went on a walk. Normally I'm quite aware of my surroundings, especially at night, but since there was a lot of people around, I put in my earphones and listened to some relaxing music. The walk started off great. I was watching the beautiful nightlife on the promenade and the other resorts. After 30 minutes, I went to sit on a bench to tie my shoelaces. In the corner of my eye, I noticed a man, stopping and sitting on the second bench away from me. I didn't find it suspicious yet. I got up and started to walk again, and I noticed that the man got up too and was walking about 20 meters behind me. I slowed down my pace and put my earphones in my pocket. I was getting suspicious, but I wanted to know for sure. Again, I stopped and pretended to search for something on my phone. He stopped as well. The problem with the promenade, it is a long line, so I had to pass the creepy man to get back to my hotel. Since I was still surrounded by people, I felt somewhat safe. In my head, I had the most genius plan to go down to the beach and hide behind one of the beach chairs. The beach was pitch black, and in my mind, this was the best solution. I started to speed up. The creepy man didn't match my pace yet. Then a big group of people passed by, and I made a run to the beach and hid. Thirty seconds later, I saw him looking from the promenade in my direction. He was searching for me. I was hoping he'd give up but he started making his way towards the beach chairs. That moment, I didn't think, and started running on the beach. Once I was far enough, I went back on the promenade and sprinted. Completely soaked in sweat, I stopped in front of my hotel and looked back. I had lost the creepy man. I had rushed back to my room. That was the one and only time I went walking alone. I know I should have asked for help from people around me, so just because you're surrounded by people, don't think you're safe. This happened to me last summer, and it still gives me chills to think about. That day, I went to the thrift store with my boyfriend. And as we were heading back home, I suggested we pick up some sushi for dinner at our nearby grocery store. As my boyfriend works night shifts, he was already feeling tired and suggested that I go to the store while he goes back home. We live in the busy part of our city, where the mall, library, city hall, restaurants, major stores and everything else are all a couple of minutes away from our home. Not to mention, I live in a relatively safe city with little crime so I was more than alright with going by myself. Now, I truly wish I hadn't. As we parted ways, I was walking through the parking lot of the grocery store, 
when a stocky man, about six foot five, probably in his early to mid forties, approached me. With a white smile and wider eyes, he said, Wow, you are stunning. I simply thanked him and tried walking away. He cut me off, saying, I've never seen someone as beautiful as you before. I was immediately filled with dread. I looked back, hoping my boyfriend was still in sight. No luck. It may seem like an exaggeration to be wary of a person right off the bat, but having read and watched true crime and horror stories for years, coupled with having extreme social anxiety and being a smaller woman with zero fighting skills, I have always sided with caution. Not to mention with his eyes and smile, he honestly reminded me of a buffer Art the Clown from Terrifier, minus the clown costume and lack of talking. The man roped me into a one-sided conversation, asking me my name and how old I was. I gave him a fake name. I told him I was 19. He laughed and said unnaturally excitedly, That's good. That means you're a true woman now. What the actual fuck? My boyfriend later told me I should have lied and said I was under 18, as this may have made the man uninterested. From the red flags I got from this man, I seriously doubt that. He then stuck his phone out, asking for my number. I refused, saying I had a boyfriend. And, I just want to talk to you, he said. I repeated that I had a boyfriend. It was unnerving how his smile never wavered despite showing that I wasn't interested. It was like he wasn't understanding, or he just didn't care. He sounded confused, but still grinning, he stepped towards me and asked, So you don't want to cheat on your boyfriend? As if to say, what do you mean you don't want to go out with a scary-ass man that's double your age? Speechless, I stepped back and gave pleading looks to the people walking in and out of the grocery store. After the last time I refused, his smile suddenly dropped, while he placed his hand on my back, saying in a now cold, firm tone, Come on, I have a nice car I can drive you around in. Let's check out one of these restaurants. Seeing a person's entire demeanor change with a flip of a switch was something I only saw in the movies or on TV shows, and seeing it in this situation fucking terrified me. Going into panic mode, I somehow found the courage to push myself off of him and almost shouted, Sorry, I really have to go buy my groceries, noticing that people were staring at us. His sick smile reappeared and said with a low voice, Alright then, I'll see you later. I practically ran into the store with so much relief. I glanced back, hoping to see him get into his car and try getting his license plate number only to see the man just standing in the middle of the parking lot, leering at me. Shit. I called my boyfriend in the store, but it kept going to voicemail. I figured he was sleeping, and I was seriously scared to walk back home. I managed to calm myself down in the store, figuring the man must be long gone. Yet I was on high alert the entire walk home. It was starting to get dark but I figured if I just stayed cautious and walked quickly, I would be fine. I couldn't be more wrong. When I was approaching the crosswalk that led to my street, I heard a car pulling up to the sidewalk, followed by a sickeningly familiar voice barking. Hey, hi, hey, hi. My heart dropped into my stomach. I glanced sideways at the car with his unmistakably now malicious looking grin plastered on his face. The man's upper body was leering out of his car window as if he was trying to reach out to me. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. He tauntingly called out, So where's your boyfriend? while cackling. From everything I've learned from true crime and horror stories, I figured it was best to not acknowledge the man my mind racing while trying to appear composed. I knew I couldn't lead him to my house, and turning back to go to the mall or stores may have given away that I was terrified and trying to escape. Bless whoever designed my neighborhood, as the city's rec center was conveniently right next to my complex. I ignored him and casually crossed the street. 
quickening my pace as I headed into the rec center. I tried not to look back, scared that I would see the man running up on me with his wide grin. But I made it into the rec center and finally looked behind me. I assumed the man would have followed me in or waited for me in his car. Instead, he sped away down a street opposite from my house. With so much relief, I called my boyfriend who woke up to my call. I was on the verge of breaking down, but managed to fill him in on everything. He rushed to the rec center, and after he calmed me down, we walked home. My boyfriend asked if I got the man's license plate number, to which I felt like a fucking idiot. Not only was it too dark, but I was too consumed with fear for my own life that it didn't even cross my mind at the time. At the very least, I called the police, giving them a description of the man and the make and model of his car. They said they would do what they could, but I haven't heard back from them. I haven't seen the man since, not in person at least, but I still see that man's smile in my dreams, haunting me for countless nights, plaguing my mind thinking about every sadistic, glaring look he had in his car reminds me that he was overjoyed to realize that I was alone and vulnerable, that my seemingly safe city isn't as safe as I thought. At the same time, I felt so grateful that the man never found out where I lived, but for all I know, he could be lurking around, trying to harm other women like he tried to that night he almost trailed me home. For mine and the women in my city's sake, I hope I don't have to find out. While still in the depths of Arctic winter, with the equinox approaching the day slash night cycle becoming more even, my flight to the slope was delayed due to a large blizzard which shut down the dead horse and Caparook airstrips. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were able to fly. Landing at the Caparook airstrip, it was evident the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are common, actual snow accumulation is not. This storm, though, was a monster. Snowdrifts several stories tall ran up against the camp housing. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow, and it took a full day of digging to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is a nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer escort us, breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house, and we began to rig up our equipment. It took little time, and soon we were back to the normal humdrum life of Arctic oil well maintenance. Over the radio, we got a call from the bulldozer operator as he left, that he'd seen a giant black animal headed in our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals aren't active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen, and foxes or the usual wildlife you'll encounter out in the snow. The animals keep to themselves for the most part, but you learn very quickly to never look the animals in the eyes if they approach you. This goes doubly for the white foxes, and I advise you to do the same. The grizzlies are hibernating, male polar bears are hunting on the sea ice, while the females are denned up with new cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operators saw, we would keep watch, but it wasn't our problem. It was a problem for the bear police. We went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers who, besides being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the Bear Police, which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are the only personnel on the North Slope that carry firearms, outside of regular law enforcement, of course. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done with beanbag guns or loud noises at first, 
When that fails, or the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force is needed. We had settled into our work and forgot about the wolf or dog or whatever it was. I needed to take a leak. I got out of the truck and walked behind the well house to take care of business. My crewmate came over the radio telling me to get back into the truck. There was a wolf coming out from behind the well house where I'd just been and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me. I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I'm not taking my chances, even if it was a crewmate practical joke. Once inside, I looked out, and sure enough, trotting towards the truck was a large, black, male wolf. He approached our trucks and sat down in the snow in front of us. This wolf looked rough, even by wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and deformed, missing his right eye and most of his skin and lips on that side of his head. The wound exposed large, white teeth, giving him the appearance of a wide, crooked smile. He didn't appear aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off us. That one good eye was bright red in appearance. It was eerie, the way he sat there staring, watching, waiting. We radioed the security officers for help, and like a speeding bullet, they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting there, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. If I hadn't seen him breathing, I would have assumed it was a statue. The security officers arrived and took some pictures for their reports. Then they began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle him. He didn't even flinch. Charging him with their truck did nothing either. They took aim with their beanbag gun and hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp, but didn't get up or move from his spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head, and that jolted him enough to get up and leave. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting, and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual. You either get used to the long hours, or you find another line of work pretty quick. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck, and weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out and losing signal, or they were reporting data backwards. But diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer systems, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and cables, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for not more than five minutes, before the night was pierced by a long, bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmate. Throwing the door open, I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a large, dark figure running behind the well house. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside, pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline. He tried to relate what just happened. Through his panting, he said he was in the well house checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back turned. When he got no reply, he turned and was met face to face with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on his hind legs. It stood between him and the door, growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast and struck him hard in the chest. That's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant that it was the same wolf from earlier because its face was mangled in that crooked half smile and one fiery red eye. Myself and the others on the crew had a hard time believing he saw a giant wolf man. We had no doubt he saw the wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic, he hallucinated that it was upright like a man. But we'd all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible. We radioed the security officers and told them the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. What else could we do but wait? I wasn't about to go there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and mouse pad. Every time we felt like things settled down outside, we would hear a growl or something would push against the truck. 
Periodically, we could see something pacing in the dark just beyond the reach of the work lights. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped. I'm sure it felt similar to what divers experience inside a shark cage far out at sea. All of this went on for an hour while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road we could see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team had showed up, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio we told them what had been going on. You could feel their disbelief and eyes rolling through the radio. The sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the work site and found it covered in fresh, large wolf tracks. The security team split up with two trucks headed out to search for the wolf while the last one remained with us as we loaded our equipment and finished our job. We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night. A set of tracks left off the work site and out into the open tundra. The officers commented that the tracks looked weird. This was due to them only seeing the back paw prints in the snow. The last security truck escorted us back to the main camp while the others continued their search into the night. For the following week, various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. And at night, reports kept coming in of a black beast walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security seemed to always show up minutes too late. During this time frame, many of the Alaskan native workers were getting nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was from Nuiqsut, a small Inupiat village just west of the oil field. He told us it sounded exactly like a... Ijira a shape-shifting creature that can take the form of any arctic animal while it hunts. He said it was obvious as the wolf was a normal animal in the daylight, but transformed into an upright monster after nightfall. The Ijirak are thought to be Inuit hunters that traveled too far north and became stuck between the world of the living and the dead. They transformed into evil, deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes. They used their power of shape-shifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. The Inupiat are very wary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote work site. It had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits, but were otherwise fine. Having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. Security shot the wolf once, and instead of dropping dead, it charged the officer that shot it. The wolf took three more high-powered rifle shots before it eventually collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed in the now crimson snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked, wide smile. After several minutes, it finally succumbed to its wounds. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarled appearance, the biologist concluded it was an ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountains. How it got hundreds of miles from home and why it stayed on the tundra is a complete mystery. This happened back in 2016 on Christmas Eve night. We'd just gotten back from my sister's and we were sitting in the car for a few. It was fairly cold. Also, side note, we had a bunch of cats, so at first we hadn't thought anything of it. We sat there for about 10 minutes and we heard rustling. Not thinking anything about it because of the cats, we blew it off. Not even a minute later, we heard it again. My mom just so happened to look up and there was a bald man in a wife-beater tank top and shorts. My mom and I both had that uneasy feeling because of his choice of clothing. It was 32 degrees and he's in summer clothes. Weird. My mom has her window cracked and he was barely a foot from our car. My mom yelled out to him and said to back away from our car. 
which surprise he didn't. He continued to stand there and stare at us. My mom decided to try and scare him. She yelled out to him that she had a gun and would blow his shit away. She didn't have a gun on her, but she definitely made sure he thought she did. He threw his hands up, but continued to get closer to our car, so my mom threw her phone at me and I was told to dial 911. I told the dispatcher what was going on, and she said she'd have the police there right away. My mother proceeded to try and run him down because he went between two porches but our car wouldn't fit because of how close the porches were to each other. Finally, after half a fucking hour later, the cops finally showed up and took our statements. The station was literally right down the road from us, and if he had actually tried something, I felt as if it would have been too late. If he hadn't run, I wouldn't have thought he had ill intentions, but he ran, so I was very pissed off that it took so long for the cops to show up. The cops stayed and looked everywhere for him, but came up empty. My mom nor I slept that night or finished opening presents because of fear that he would come back. The police thought that maybe he wanted to steal the gifts that were in the car, but we may never know. The scariest part is, Months later, it came to light that he'd escaped jail. He was put in for assault, so who knows what he would have done to me and my mom. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. A tarp was required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, in woods on a second lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a white shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I flat just did a shitty job tarping this load and decided to redo it on the side of the road. I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the ladder and start unrolling the tarps again. And I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on him because I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place, and I'm climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this guy's getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working, just in case. The guy gets to me, and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's patchy as hell. It was like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process, and said, Fuck it, good enough to party. The next thing I noticed were his eyes, which I can only describe as... Off. Like they were clear. I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, and with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have any laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere, making it clear there's no right to be had here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way, stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. He comes back to me and repeats himself, I've got a long walk. At this point I explain to him that I can't give him a ride, insurance and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and start working on finishing the tarp job. 
and I still keep an eye on it, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around, heading back towards me. Now about a hundred yards in front of my truck, and coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on a cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his moving mouth. His other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing into my truck as he's about ten yards away now. As soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors. I set the winch bar on the passenger seat, just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand. And now I'm nervous because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it into gear, and just pull out. I didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead-ass look on it, just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me. Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.